let's start off with the pathologies and let's start with the rotator cuff here now i'm not going to go too much into the anatomy but the important thing about the rotator cuff insertion is that all the four tendons mainly the supraspinatus and infraspinatus they interdigitate distally and they form a conjoined tendon which inserts onto the middle facet of the greater tuberosity this insertion is called the footprint and even anteriorly some fibers of the supraspinatus will interdigitate with the subscapularis this is important because uh, when you are evaluating rotator cuff pathologies and tears extension from one tendon to another often happens because of this interdigitation and functionally also the rotator cuff is considered as one unit helping in the movements and stability of the shoulder joint uh broadly your shoulder pathology is divided into rotator cuff disorder and non rotator when we are talking about the cuff the pathologies we deal with are tendinitis different types of tears which could be partial or full thickness tears impingement of the cuff and calcific tendinitis pathogenesis of the rotator cuff disease many uh, theories have been implicated there are extrinsic causes one of which is your extrinsic impingement which normally comes from the acromioclavicular joint either from hypertrophy osteoarthritis or also from structural abnormalities in the acromion typically a type 3 acromion then trauma or a repetitive micro trauma from overuse of the shoulder are all the exit causes intrinsic causes are degenerative changes within the cuff itself which could be age related could be due to underlying metabolic or vascular causes and typically there is a spectrum of disease in the rotator cuff which includes tendinitis tears partial and then might progress to full thickness tears the articular surface of the tendon and the critical zone which is just proximal to the insertion are relatively hypervascular portions of the tendon and hence these are the most commonly affected uh, segments of the tendon and supraspinatus is the commonest tendon which is involved when it comes to imaging of the shoulder radiographs are always the first line imaging which we use for evaluating localized shoulder pain or in cases of trauma uh, some of the features that may indicate an underlying cuff disease on radiographs are cystic changes irregularity or sclerosis of the greater tuberosity acromiocular arthritis or acromial spurs with reduction of subacromial space may indicate an underlying impingement or a superior humeral migration indicates cuff insufficiency this is an important a uh, finding on a radiograph because if this is missed then a rotator cuff uh, abnormality might actually just be missed sonography high resolution sonography is a very very sensitive method for evaluating the cuff itself and can pick up the entire spectrum of cuff disease mri is used for confirming these tears or tendinitis and to look for further anatomical uh, details such as retraction of the extension into adjacent tendons to look for involvement of the bicipital labral complex and other also look to look for associated muscle atrophy uh, the technique has already been covered so i'm not going to go into this important is to get the planes right for coronal sagittal images so that we are planning our sequences along the supraspinatus tendon itself now uh, an important thing when you're evaluating the cuff is to differentiate tendinitis versus tear tendinitis the tendon itself the normally all the tendons are seen as high tend structures on pd t1 and t2 weighted images in tendinitis you will see thickening of the tendon with increased signal on pd fat suppressed images however the signal is less than that of the fluid now when there is a joint effusion this is a very helpful sign because it helps to differentiate small intrasubstance tears from a tendinitis itself when it comes to a tear the minute you see any fluid signal intensity within the tendon on t2 or on pd you start thinking about a tear so you either have a partial thickness or you get a full thickness tear now to give you examples here this is a fat suppressed pd image and this is a non fat suppressed pd image here we are seeing there is increased signal within the tendon compared to that on the next image we are seeing that there is a linear intrasubstance fluid cleft seen within the supraspinatus tendon and this indicates a partial thickness intrasubstance tear full thickness tears uh, are easier to identify than a partial thickness tear because you're seeing a complete focal discontinuity of the tendon again when there is a joint effusion or there is subacromial bursal fluid it is easy to compare this signal the fluid signal with the adjacent fluid around it uh, again to give you another example and this is especially in smaller tears this you are seeing some mild increase in the signal intensity suggesting a tendinitis 
you have clearly seen a higher fluid signal intensity which can be compared with this minimal intraarticular fluid and so this becomes a partial thickness tear just another example of an articular surface tear here now when we are talking about mri of the cuff tears there are many factors which influence uh, the way a tear is managed and they also influence a surgical outcome of a rotator cuff tear so these are the important things that we need to look for and a uh, report on our studies one is the type of tear and the extent of the tear so we need to determine whether it is a partial thickness or a full thickness tear when we are dealing with partial thickness tears we need to evaluate the depth of involvement of the tendon thickness in a full thickness tear we need to give dimensions both the length and the width of the tear we need to evaluate the underlying condition of the tendon itself whether it is normal or there is underlying tendinotic changes within it the shape of a tear the degree of retraction from the attachment whether there is extension into other tendons and whether there is any associated muscle atrophy and fatty degeneration uh there are certain mri findings uh, which are important to report which some orthopedic surgeons may even consider full cases of surgery but there is no hard and fast rule about this we have to report these findings and leave it up to the surgeon to decide so some findings like a superior humeral migration if there is tendon retraction up to the gland or beyond it and if there is significant muscle atrophy these findings are considered as irreparable cases by some of the surgeons if there are any associated neurologic conditions around the shoulder and significant muscle atrophies uh, of the calf tendons or the deltoid muscle these will also affect recovery of strength after the surgery the commonest tendon which is involved is your supraspinatus however the tears can easily extend into the infra and the subscapularis tendons even biceps tendon involvement has been known and all these can influence the type of surgery and the post surgical outcomes now let's look at the partial thickness tears partial thickness tears are seen as focal areas of increased fluid signal intensity in the tendon or an incomplete gap in the tendon continuity based on location they are classified as articular surface interstitial and bursal surface and based upon the involvement of the tendon thickness they are classified from grade 1 to grade 3 which includes grade 1 is less than 25% involvement grade 2 is less than 50% thickness and grade 3 is more than 50% thickness involvement it is important to identify grade 3 tears because these are normally the ones which can be treated surgically and if left untreated they can progress to full thickness tears smaller tears may be treated non surgically also especially in asymptomatic cases so let's look at the partial thickness tears now based on location what we have to see is that there is a discontinuity in the articular surface of the tendon here but you can see that the overlying bursal surface is smooth and the fibers appear to be intact so this becomes an articular surface tear here we are seeing that both the bursal and the articular surface of the tendon appear to be intact but there is a linear intrasubstance gap which is seen and hence this becomes an interstitial tear partial thickness coming to the bursal surface tears you can see a discontinuity in the bursal surface the rest of the tendon appears to be smooth although there is increased signal intensity and its tendinotic the fibers appear to be smooth so this becomes a partial thickness bursal surface tear based on the depth of involvement the tears are graded as grade 1 to grade 3 so to show you this is just the subtle cleft in the articular surface fibers here there is about 50% involvement of the tendon thickness and this is a high grade or a grade 3 partial thickness articular surface tear where there is a rim muscle surface fibers see similarly uh, with the bursal surface fibers also they can be graded this is a grade 2 where 50% of the tendon thickness is involved and this is a high grade bursal surface tear where there is only a few articular fibers which are intact coming to full thickness tears these are normally seen as a focal dis complete thickness discontinuity in the tendon extending from articular to bursal surface we have to measure the size in two dimensions the length and the width and also mention the degree of retraction of the tendon now because of the contiguous insertion of the rotator cuff tendons on the greater tuberosity tears can extend from one tendon to another and looking for these especially on sagittal images is very very important the size of the tear can affect the type of surgery which may be considered whether it's an open or an arthroscopic surgery it can also influence post surgical recovery rates and can also affect recurrence rates of tears full thickness tears have been classified based on size as small medium large and massive 
but uh, again it is important to mention the dimensions rather than get into uh, different classifications certain findings like superior humeral migration tendon retractions medial to the glenoid or significant fatty atrophy or muscle atrophy are considered irreparable by some surgeons now a full thickness tear will be seen as a complete gap here we're seeing the supraspinatus tendon and there is a complete gap which is seen near the insertion of the supraspinatus tendon so this becomes a full thickness insertional tear here the insertion of the tendon appears to be intact but there is a full thickness tear in the critical zone these are the two areas of the supraspinatus tendon which are most prone and this is just a uh, degrees of retraction which there are here the proximal tendon is quite close to the attachment here the tendon is retracted up to the level of the acromion and here the retraction is beyond or up to the level of the glenoid so mentioning the degree of tendon retraction is also important in our images these are examples of smaller full thickness tears uh, here we are seeing a full thickness tear near the insertion length of the tear is so this is how you measure it in two planes you give the length and on sagittal images you also give the width you can see the rest of the tendon supraspinatus tendon appears to be quite thickened and tendinotic but otherwise uh, that is only really seen on the anterior part of the tendon this is a full thickness focal critical zone tear again we have to measure the length of the gap and we can see that the insertion appears to be intact uh, just again uh, just smaller examples of uh, you know the smaller tears where you are seeing not much retraction of the tendon and the importance of seeing the tendon and tracing the tendon on all three planes you can also see the ten the tear on axial images you can see the discontinuity very well on sagittal images and look at the other rotator cuff tendons also on sagittal images now extension of the tear needs to be mentioned they can either extend from anterior supraspinatus tendon into the subscapularis tendon or commonly from your supraspinatus tendon they extend into the conjoint and infraspinatus tendon also one important thing is to recognize if there is any subscapularis or biceps tendon involvement because these structures are often difficult to determine arthroscopically biceps tears can also be seen associated with anterior supraspinatus and subscapularis tears important finding of a subscapularis tear is for uh, medial subluxation of the biceps tendon and this is something we need to be looking for on the axial images it indicates an underlying subscapularis tear so just a few examples of tear extension here we are seeing a focal tear at the insertion of the supraspinatus tendon there's also reduction in the subacromial space and a prominent inferior acromial spur now when we look at the sagittal images we see that the conjoint tendon itself appears to be quite thickened and there is a lot of irregularity of the uh, tendon at the insertion whereas the posterior infraspinatus fibers appear to be intact so this here there is extension into the anterior infraspinatus tendon also which is seen now this is an anterior supraspinatus tear the degree of retraction is all up to the, the glenoid we can see that there is an extension into the infraspinatus tendon also so this is uh, again on the sagittal images you can see the footprints and the insertions of all the tendons your anteriorly you can see the subscapularis the insertion of the supra and the infraspinatus is gone a few infraspinatus fibers are there and this is the teres minor c in anterior supraspinatus tears when you look at the axial images you can clearly see here that there is an empty bicipital groove and if you scroll you able to trace the biceps tendon so the biceps tendon has moved medially almost uh, lying adjacent to the glenoid fossa So this is called as medial subluxation of the biceps tendon, and this is the retracted subscapularis muscle and tendon complex. So this is basically a case of anterior supraspinatus tear and a subscapularis tear seen in a case of trauma.